mommy is carrying around to uh, take your money. My name is Debbie Lambert Bergman. I'm the curator of education and public programs here at Mormon. Um, and one of the best things about my job is that I get to coordinate this program, which was, as Jill said, a big hit last year and it was a bigger hit this year. So uh, this evening, I'm delighted to introduce you to Dr. Young Silkowski. He is the Arthur Kingsley Porter Professor of Medieval Latin at Harvard University and Director of the Dumbarton Oaks Research Library and Collection, which brings him to us this evening. Um, he is an author, scholar, and past winner of the Rome Prize. Uh, Dr. Zolkowski recently said he lives and reads for the humanities and arts, as we all do here in this room. Uh, in fact, though, he founded the Dumbarton Oaks Medieval Library, which presents original languages with facing English translations, including 70 volumes of Byzantine Greek, Medieval Latin, and Old English. I want questions on this after. <laughs> <laughs> Recently, Dr. Zolkowski arranged for a museum exhibition, reprints, and translations of children's books, and a six-volume study of the Juggler of Notre Dame, exploring a single story from its first incarnation in a medieval French poem in the early 13th century through its later inception from the 1870s down to the present day. This evening, Dr. Zolkowski takes us inside Dumbarton Oaks, the historic Washington, D.C. estate, former residence and garden of Robert Woods Bliss and his wife Mildred Barnes Bliss, which today supports scholarship in Byzantine and pre-Columbian studies, as well as garden design and landscape architecture and the landscape architecture was originally created by the remarkable Beatrix Braun. So we're in for a very exhilarating start to Morley's Grand Homes and Garden series, and we heartily welcome Dr. Jan Zolkowski. I'd like to thank everyone for such a warm welcome, and especially to uh, Debbie for having coordinated this visit, and I hope that uh, I'm able to live up to the uh, promises that have been given and that I won't be showstopper for the series in a negative way by coming <laughs> into it. Look, uh, this is a very special evening for me because um, Princeton was my home from 1964 through 1977. I uh, went to elementary school, middle school, public school, and the high schools, and then to the, uh, I attended Princeton for my undergraduate years, and uh, my parents still still live in town, so it's just um, a treat to come back. I'm not going to be talking, and you can heave a sigh of relief about uh, medieval Latin to you tonight, uh, but, uh, but but, but instead, I'm going to be talking about the other part of my identity, which is through Dumbarton Oaks, where I've been director, and I've had just the blessing of being the director there for 13 years now. And I say blessing, I would feel that way under any circumstances, but maybe all the more so because of the difficulties that that period has seen with the uh, financial crisis and then with our society in, in tumult. Uh, I'll, I'll come back to that. Uh, having a chance to, I, I go to uh, Harvard usually one day a week to teach and shuttling between two such different places has given me certain perspectives I never would have had the chance of acquiring um, otherwise. And I, I, I am passionate about the humanities and arts, and since those are in, uh, they always are in crisis, you'll find as you look back, but uh, they, they always feel in a precarious position. Uh, the feeling of being precarious may be more, um, more deserved now, and Dumbarton Oaks is a place that's been able, because of the unique vision of the donors, to help support them. So that's what makes uh, has made me feel very, uh, very privileged. Oh, that's right. Turning it on always helps. <laughs> there. Look at that. Uh, so. As far as, as far as my time here, I, I actually um, was um, in school, in the public schools here during the governorships of 
those two governors, and you can see I'm not being partisan, got one from each party. Uh, and then after I graduated from college, my, my uh, father became dean of the, of the grad school and lived in Wyman House, which is this spectacular house that's right near the grad college. The connection here is that the landscaping there was done by uh, Beatrix Farrand, a remarkable woman uh, act who, who put her imprint all over the country, especially on campuses, on uh, private, uh, at, uh, private estates, uh, up, up and down this seaboard, but also in, in, in many other parts of the country. And I'll be coming back to her because uh, what Dunbarton Oaks is really owes to her collaboration with Mildred List. And then uh, the, the uh, female uh, uh, portion of the couple who gave Dunbar notes. And then uh, just one last little note. Um, the author of this wonderful book on Morven is the mother of someone that I attended high school with, uh, Jim Grafe. So uh, thinking about Morven made me think about a lot in connection with my uh, upbringing and, and, and high school friends. So look, uh, in 19, 1957, Carl Feist, who, who was an a urban planner, uh, referred to this area as um, a, a America's most civilized square mile. You can see, and let's see if I can, uh, okay. So you, you can see there, this, this is art, the artificial turf of a Boys and Girls Club. And then above it is Dumbarton Oaks. There's a private portion, which is everything down below, that's uh, to the west. And then you'll see houses, uh, a, a big edifice here, which is the, um, the, the main mansion, which is now museums and administration. And then surrounding it are the formal gardens. But you notice that there, there's an even greater extent of, of woodland there. And that's because Dumbarton Oaks leads into Dumbarton Oaks Park, which is part of what used to be the estate, but has been given to, uh, was given in 1940 to the National Park Service. And then another part of the estate was uh, the embassy of of Denmark, if I'm pointing uh, correctly, that was the um, northwestern extent of the property. And the, as far as what's in the neighborhood, you'll see embassies identified there, Sri Lanka, Italy, Brazil. Uh, the vice president's residence is over in that direction, right across, so Pence is over there, and then continuing being bipartisan, across from the embassy of Denmark is uh, where Hillary Clinton's home is, Whitehaven, which she referred to as a fortress of solitude when she was uh, writing books. Zeroing in a little bit more, you can see again that artificial turf, then you can see the private parts of the estate, and then you can see the, uh, that big building that I indicated, that's the, the main house. The, the, the main part of it was built in um, 1800, and then a little addition was added in 1810, but the rest of it toward 32nd Street was added by the Blisses in the 1930s, 20s, 30s, uh, and 60s. So here, continuing in closer again, you can see that, the, again, the main house, the orangerie from 1810, and then the parts of the building that they added uh, as they decided to turn it into a public institution. Pan back. And you see that uh, I've been emphasizing the kind of sylvan setting of this, that it's actually at the northern extreme of a wealthy but very densely inhabited part of town, Georgetown. And then here, to translate it into map terms, the, uh, the, the red there <coughs> indicates property that belongs to Dumbarton Oaks uh, on the you, you see the private buildings here, 
of the main of the main campus. The main, and then you see that big building that I was referring to uh, before. The uh, the main campus was originally the property was fifty three acres. When when they at its maximum, uh, they gave away before the university would accept it all but sixteen and a quarter. Ten acres of it are the garden, and then six and a quarter are where those private buildings are. And then I'll come back. We've added uh, in my time. We've been blessed to to be able to add more housing for fellows and visitors there. And then I, I will come back and mention uh, this building um, at, at, at a uh, later moment. So they lived from 18, he was born in 1875. His name was Robert Woods Bliss, uh, lived to 1962. She was born in 1879 and lived to 1969. They gave the building to the, the uh, property to Harvard in 1940 lived on, stayed in the neighborhood in another house that they bought, and I think of them as having been hover donors, uh, which is not a problem that you have here. They, uh, so that she checked in really on a daily basis, served tea, but also kept an eye out to make sure that it was being guided the way that she wanted. Their vision was a, a very detailed and coherent one. And you can see part of it here in this preamble to her last will after her husband had died. So quality, not quantity. She wanted it to be the home of the humanities. And she looked at that as uh, not being just the kind of specialization that she saw going on not just an accumulation, but an emphasis on a particular kind of style of aesthetics. So the house, the gardens, and uh, the, the, the scholarship all fit together. Continuing with that, this emphasis on uh, not confusing instruction with education. So it's not a teaching place, but it's a place where, in, in the sense of lectures, but it's a place where you're supposed to be able to learn and grow. Uh, their experiences with World War I and World War II resulted in a kind of uh, anti-Teutonic bent, which is why there's that strange reference to the Mediterranean interpretation of the humanist discipline. So that basically means not German. <laughs> Gardens belong in the humanist in paper. That remains very important to us, but also to project on the web so that more people can benefit. So here's something very esoteric, a catalog of, of textiles, Eastern Mediterranean, that uh, have their root in the in Mildred Bliss's collection that expanded since then. So we've come out with that in print, but it's also on the web so that anyone uh, can can get at it. And in that in those three fields that I mentioned, there's a kind of sibling rivalry. So if you give something to Byzantine, you better make sure that you give something to pre-Columbian and Guardian landscape too, or else you're going to have some uh, very uh, angry people around. Um, so we have a Moche online archive, and I, I urge you to explore our website uh, and, and to uh, see if, uh, if you find things that will attract you there. And then uh, we've expanded programming to benefit recent graduates of the college, and of Harvard College, and we've really benefited from the energy and creativities of young people that we bring in for a year or two. People find out about the humanities later and later in their education, and this gives them a chance if they've gotten the spark and they want to see what they they want to see what goes on in all these different departments that I've described. When they come on these fellowships, they have a chance to work half of the year with a neighboring institution and then half of the year with us at Dumbart Notes. And they, the neighboring institutions, the elephant is the uh, Smithsonian. Next to it is the National Gallery of Art. Continuing over to the right is the Smithsonian Folkways. 
Down at the bottom is the Textile Museum and the George Washington University Museum, and lower right is the uh, is, is the Folger Shakespeare Library. So they're getting to see from the inside, before they've had jobs in, in their careers, how different institutions work, and then they learn from each other about all the different aspects that go into the whole venture of the humanities, not just those fields of ours, but also then the museum, the uh, library, the, the publications. Uh, great universities have all of these elements, but it often would be extremely hard to go from one to the other to the other in a, in a single day because they're spread around. It would be even harder to break into the separate cultures of them, but, but when they're with us, they have a chance to see them cheek by jowl and then to benefit from other young people. So I mentioned sibling rivalry and uh, it, it's amazing how uh, I'm a medievalist, I am not, alas, a Byzantinist or a pre columbianist or a garden and landscape uh, studies scholar, and yet um, I have oversight for them. I tread carefully with all three areas, partly out of respect, but partly out of fear. Uh, you, you can see what the Byzantines did to each other in the old days, and I don't want it happening again now. And you can see what, what, what uh, the pre-Columbianists study, and uh, they know this well, and I watch out, I still have my heart. I won't say anything about art and landscape space. Now, I'm going to jump around just a little bit because the, the nature of the place requires that. This is the cover of a booklet, and you can see the title there, Angels Could Do It Better, The Story of the Heaven It was published in 1945 by a consortium of unions. And on one of the first pages, it, it, it has this little snippet that I've given you saying, Dumbarton Oaks is one of the most popular names in America today. You can hardly pick up a newspaper or a magazine or turn on the radio without seeing or hearing Dumbarton Oaks referred to in one way or another. Ask your barber or your butcher or your cigar dealer uh, when you whisper any cigarettes today. Ask anybody whether he's heard of Dumbarton Oaks and they'll answer promptly, sure. Well. That's, alas, not as much the case now. When I, I, if I want to get uh, depressed or more depressed, I'll go to Google Ngram, which allows you to track word frequency from the beginning of printed books down to 2012. And Dumbart Notes has a huge spike going from 1940 up to the 60s, and then it, and then it pretty much goes down uh, steeply after that, you know, it would not be what you'd want to see as your returns on stock investments or something. Uh, the, the reason for its frequency in that period has to do with the end of World War II and the thoughtfulness with which people pieced together the world at that point. Dunbar Notes is not Bretton Woods, that they're, they're very separate, but it is the Dunbar and Oaks Conversations of 1944. And you can see here in, in the music room, which is still our largest museum space, also still our largest event space, the opening session of those conversations with uh, three of the delegations. I'll come back to that, but it was those conversations that laid the foundations for the resolution to establish the United Nations. That happened after Dumbarton Oaks had been given over to become a research institute. It was uh, gifted beginning in 1940. The Blisses were extremely shrewd people about institutions. Uh, and so they made sure to have many of their guiding principles, their foundational wishes embedded in plaques on the wall outside. Uh, because they know how easy it is once you're, once you're gone for your will to be forgotten and for other people to do just whatever they want. And, and that would be hard under the, uh, under the circumstances. At, by being part of Harvard, 
They're like, it, it's like the Arnold Arboretum, the Center for Linux Studies, uh, from, which was founded by Mellons, Villa Itaki by Berenson in Florence, Italy, and then a few other institutions that belong to Harvard, but it's in DC. And um, DC, the, the, Mr. Smith goes to Washington, it was 1939. 2020 is a different picture. Um, I don't think that as many people come to DC to watch the effectiveness of the, of the government as was once the case, but um, oddly, there was a bulge of young people after the financial crisis because DC, the, 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 the federal government was one of the few places left in the game of hiring people when uh, places like Wall Street weren't. And also, the nation's capital has just uh, wonderful museums. It has uh, the Kennedy Center, it has the monuments, Park cemeteries, and then it has many different facilities for research, government, um, universities, and then think tanks. What's really amazed me from being there and thinking about it is realizing just how many of these big enterprises aren't just government, but they're the result of this American dynamic that brings together the public and the private. And I've been impressed again and again just by the generosity, the good that has come out of people, how much they've wanted to help other people and to share what they have loved. Um, and so if you think the Smithsonian goes back to a person who never set foot in the, in the United States. National Gallery, was largely the result of Mellon, who had the uh, supreme generosity to suppress his name in the, in the name of the institution. Folger Shakespeare Library, Freer Sackler, Phillips, Renwick, many others. If you're interested in these, we have something called Mapping Cultural Philanthropy, a website that has information, not on all, but on many of these different um, institutions and we're trying to make it complete and then, uh, and then broaden it. Looking into the past is also a reminder of the care that's required to perpetuate your values, to keep your money going across time. The Barnes is not what, what uh, he had wanted. It still goes on, but in a very different place. The Corcoran. One of the first three art museums in the country is effectively uh, gone now. As I've looked at this institution, I've seen uh, all of the changes that it's made since it was founded, since I uh, came to know it. You, you cannot stay the same. You can't be devoted just to preserving the objects. That is the left. That's getting buried. You, if you want people, you have to create something that allows them to uh, travel across time. And the people who did that for us were these two donors, Mildred Barnes Bliss and Robert Woods Bliss, here captured in Mufti in a candid <laughs> shot at the end of a hard day. They've gotten into their sweats and their uh, relaxing. Wife and husband, and then stepsister and stepbrother. This is just a little bit of family background. Demas Barnes, congressman, someone who made a, a, a vast fortune by astutely buying up patent medicines. First wife had a daughter. She died of suicide in 1911. Second wife, um, Anna Dorinda Blacksley Barnes, was the mother of Mildred. Anna Dorinda Blacksley Barnes married William Henry Bliss, he had had uh, Robert Woods Bliss by his first wife, and the, the, the two of them married. The uh, stepbrother and stepsister knew each other as teens, but they became involved romantically later, married in 1908. This is uh, the, the Dunbar Notes was acquired around in 1920. 
And this is Robert Bliss at the White House in 1922 when he was uh, third Secretary of State. His career began in Puerto Rico. After that, he was posted to Venice, St. Petersburg, Brussels, Buenos Aires, Paris, which was really uh, extremely important in his development, 1912 to 1920, seeing the horrors of the First World War up front and being generous there too, giving the whole ambulance corps to uh, help with the well, help with the wounded, doing it anonymously. The Hague, Washington, in that post that I mentioned, minister to Sweden, basically ambassador, and then the apogee of his career, it all culminates, ambassador to Argentina from 1927 to 1933. Uh, he's Republican, Roosevelt comes in, he tenders his resignation, expecting it to be pro forma, it's not. Uh, he goes home, relatively young age, they, pour, they, they start pouring themselves even more into collecting and work their way toward this wonderful uh, vision. Now, not out of disrespect to them, because if they were here now, they would probably be happy with pretty much everything that I've said, maybe not how I've said it, uh, but they, they, would, they would not want me to go into this, but I feel an obligation for uh, historical verity to do so. The bulk of their money came from something called Fletcher's Castoria. You can see the signature down at the bottom, you can read about it. It was a children's laxative that was used uh, very widely for decades. This is a bizarre, uh, so uh, the, I, uh, we don't, we use to give someone a licking for to, uh, you know, mean one thing. Uh, the verb apparently was, could be used in different ways before. Go to the bottom photograph on the right, and you will see, uh, she said, the mother says, I'm not. All I know is that Millie Bliss uh, used to jam a bad tasting laxative down her boy until her doctor put a stop to it. This is a very interesting advertisement um, for, for many different reasons. But the Blisses imposed an advertising blackout in the Washington area on Fletcher's Castoria because they didn't want to be associated with it. And after they gave up their rights to the company, sold their stock, turned over everything to Harvard. I think that the PR people came out with this as kind of payback, uh, it, resentment for having not been allowed to advertise there. So they won this advertisement. So that's the one thing, and I, and I don't mean that out of disrespect, but it's part of just the truth of how they came to be where they were. Now, I've mentioned plaques. This is outside the museum. It has their Latin motto at the top, as you sow, so shall you reap, basically. And then underneath it has this uh, the, the statement about the Byzantine and medieval humanities, 1940. And then outside the rare book collection, a Latin motto which runs across a bookcase that's in the uh, in the music room, that the the, um, the spirit attains peace or rest in books, which is which is lovely. And then another pro garden, pro tree uh, pronouncement. <laughs> so this is this aisle of serenity, this Edenic setting for scholars, but it's there and just almost a, a stone's throw away is the Vice President's Mansion, number one observatory circle, the Clinton's home, Whitehaven, that I mentioned right across from the Danish Embassy, which used to be on their property. Down in the block is the Renwick-designed uh, chapel of Oak Hill Cemetery. 
Nearby, in terms of other historic homes, is Dumbarton House, just uh, three blocks away. Tudor Place, which is not even a, a, a block away, going back to colonial times. And then a little bit further away is Lars Anderson House, uh, which has some of the same connections with diplomacy as um, the Bliss residence does. I often, in the garden, look down and see with a certain degree of irony, because it's de it was devoted first and still largely to Byzantine studies, to see the minaret of the Islamic center there. Um, and I, I, it, it's a little bit like the uh, Ottoman Turks moving closer toward Constantinople. Um, but it's, and we, uh, we don't have uh, collaborations with, with the Islamic Center, but we do with many other uh, nations from the Eastern Mediterranean. As far as the connection with um, power and publicity goes, the last director acquired a, a residence that's across the street from Dumbarton Oaks. It's often called the Elizabeth Taylor House. That's because that's where she lived in D.C. when she was married to John Warner. <laughs> no real connection with Dumbart Notes, although uh, <laughs> there is this note that was left, that was presented to me by a staff member, which which now hangs in the in the residence, which was left on his windshield by Elizabeth Taylor, who asked him to stop parking where he was parking on, on, on her side of the street because that's where her dear maid would, would park most safely. <laughs> but now let's uh, trundle back several centuries. I haven't said anything systematically about the property. Uh, Ninian Bell, not said Beale, but Bell, uh, acquired the land in 1703. He eventually pieced together 30,000 acres, uh, and that it's out of that that what that's what's now uh, Georgetown and Dumbar Oaks was was carved. All of this information is put briefly on two plaques that are again on the wall, immured in the walls, bringing the property. The, as far as key early figures, uh, it was Dorsey that you see in the middle of this who built the house. Here it says 1801. And then in 1810, uh, the, the uh, next oldest part of the property was added, the Orangerie. The, the plaque after that is really a, a list of uh, people who owned it subsequently, and many of them were effectively bankrupted by the cost of running the property until the Blisses acquired it in 1920. So here we are with the house. They acquired here federal style house that had many Victorian accretions and they stripped them away back to the original look and then uh, began adding extensions to the house that went out to 32nd Street. Uh, and this is the part of the house, the, 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 the main house, as they revamped it. Inside, you don't normally visit. It's kept historic but it's where most of the administrative functions take place. Publications, HR, finance, uh, the Dunbar Notes Medieval Library, uh, most of the rest of the administration are there. The building as it stands now was the result of um, a, a work by many architects. The ones that I'd single out are the ones who are bolded, uh, in bold face there. Beatrix Farron, landscape designer pioneer. Lawrence Grant White of the McKim Mead and White firm, he is not his father. His father, Stanford White, was someone who was famous and infamous, but uh, had some of the same design values. I'll come back to that in just a second. 
Philip Johnson, I'll show, I'll show a couple of pictures, and then Venturi. I won't show any pictures, but Venturi is the one who um, contributed to the last big overhaul of the campus that gave us the library and a building for the gardeners and a few other things like that. Stanford White uh, was involved with Evelyn Nesbitt. He was a, a major designer, and then also, as, the, as uh, this book details, a dealer in antiquities. This was a scandalous event when Thaw, uh, when, when, when Thaw uh, killed Stanford White uh, by shooting him in the back in a restaurant. And if you're interested in a quick take on that, the girl in the red velvet swing with uh, Joan Collins. So this is the part of the McKim Mead White extension architecturally. The interior was designed by Rateau. It has a, a ceiling that's meant to evoke the 17th century Loire. It has, um, a, a, it has spolia these transported bits of architecture, the arches at the ends there. It's where the big concerts take place. That's also a spoliated uh, French Renaissance fireplace that's there. They, in their stylistic choices, the Blisses just uh, blow me away for their breadth in their 80s. As octogenarians, they built this, which is a kind of uh, faux enlightenment house for the garden library. At the same time, more or less, they gravitated toward the architecture of the cutting edge Philip Johnson, who designed this uh, beautiful set of domes that was considered as a library space, but much more happily was added as an addition to the museum. And it's there that uh, Robert Woods Bliss's pre-Columbian collection is displayed, hanging because it was felt that the art was somehow a natural pouring from people closer to nature, hanging against nature, maybe not a conception that people would favor now, but so beautiful. I, I, and I hope that you can uh, come and see it. The place keeps changing. One of the changes was putting a roof in the late uh, 80s over what had been outdoors, now the Byzantine courtyard. That leads to the Byzantine gallery, which is where the bulk of the Byzantine art is displayed. I haven't said um, that, that as much about the garden as I should. It's considered, it's ranked regularly by the National Geographic as one of the top 10 in the country, if not in the world. Part of it is just the sheer beauty of those trees that she cared about. But also, if you look below that resplendent orange tree, you see the gates with the wrought iron. Every detail was talked over. It was made in quarter scale after drawings. They would uh, have prototypes made. If they weren't happy, they would not put them, put them in. And then the plants. You can see the roses in the rose garden there. And I'm starting with this one, although I might well end with it, uh, this just quick sh show of the garden. It's where they're buried. Uh, the donors are in an alcove referred to uh, as the finality alcove. <laughs> Why did they chose that name? I can't say. Uh, in the middle of it is a vestige of the of the original uh, mansion-like quality of the house, and it does give it a, a great Gatsby-like uh, quality, a centerpiece, treasured by those who actually can still go swimming in it, uh, staff and fellows but also still loved by the people who visit the garden. The garden here, looking at it, uh, the perspective is um, going toward the south. Uh, in other words, going toward the inhabited part, but focusing on starting with the wilderness at the bottom. The terrain 
is extremely steep. The topography is very difficult, and they had, and the solution to this was to create to, uh, a plateau after plateau of uh, different rooms, each of which has that it has a distinctive character, and they're little lozenges around the outside of the map to show special features of the different rooms in the garden. There was the work of these two, Mildred Bliss and Beatrix Farron. Beatrix Farron, uh, just incidentally, was niece of Edith Wharton, the novelist, and was uh, a lifelong friend of Henry James. This is a plaque that, that the Blisses installed to commemorate Farron long before she uh, died. It was a sign of their friendship and admiration for her. This is a watercolor that was produced uh, as a kind of uh, color-coded map to the garden more recently, and it's flip-flops, the one that you saw before. You can see the house uh, there at the, at the left, the gray running over about halfway. All the rest of it, those 10 acres, is these carefully plotted rooms. And again, I'm not, I'm not going to try to go through all of them, but I just uh, in, invite you, please, to come and see. Where their tennis courts had been next to that pool, they put in a uh, pebble garden, which has uh, their sheaf in it, that as you sow, so she reap, re reminder of the, at the bottom. A, uh, one memorable portion of the garden is the ellipse, a, a circular area ringed by American hornbeams with this, an, another large piece transported from Europe, this one from Provence Fountain. I haven't said enough, and I'm not going to keep going forever, but I haven't said enough about the music. Uh, I'm starting out with, uh, as a nod to Poland, with Paderewski, whom Mildred Bliss, to whom the photograph on the right is dedicated, um, referred to him as Patty. I don't know if he would have liked that or not, but the photo on the, on the right there that has that dedication is one that the Russians insisted be removed from the music room during the conversations because they didn't agree with Paderewski's politics. Uh, the concert series has continued mostly unbroken since 1946, and they've included premieres of people such as uh, Samuel Barber. The, the name may ring a bell to some of you from uh, the, the Stravinsky, and then another commission went to Aaron Copland, another to Joan Tower, and then something that started just uh, six years ago it, uh, that has been a, a joy for me is um, we have a residency for early career composers and musicians, and the first incumbent was Carolyn Shaw, who was the earliest uh, the youngest composer ever to win a Pulitzer, and then also won a Grammy that year. And then the second was Matt O'Coin, a Harvard grad who just won a MacArthur back in the fall. Um, I, I don't know if we're going to be able to have this kind of luck steadily, but it's been really wonderful to have these artists alongside the humanists in the, in the community. The museum. I've been talking about in an unsystematic way, but I just want to give you a glimpse of what of, of how it really works with that music room, that um, magnificent room that I described, the Byzantine courtyard, the Byzantine gallery. You can see, by the way, why I chose the color backing for this presentation that I have, uh, since it's Byzantine purple. Uh, and then you can see the rare book room off there to the right. We have special exhibits regularly. There was one on Kipu that took place last spring. There was that was followed by one um, on, um, on connected with the textiles on Byzantine ornament. And then coming up, so this is prospective, not retrospective. If you do come to pay a visit, as I as I uh, urge you to do. 
He'll be this exhibit on Margaret Mead from March 24th to August 23rd. And it makes me really happy because libraries and museums have very separate cultures and sometimes have very separate aspirations about uh, what to do with their materials. And Margaret, the Margaret Mee exhibit involves both many books, but also beautiful watercolors that this extremely talented artist produced in the middle of the, of the uh, 20th century in a region that has suffered a lot of environmental uh, degradation. So um, it's, it's something beautiful and exciting and, and maybe in some ways alarming too that's coming up that ties together the museum, the books, and the garden. You won't get into the library. That's private for the, um, for, for the fellows. But you, you have access to the other library, which is the Dumbarton Oaks Medieval Library with the many different volumes in Byzantine, Greek, Medieval, Latin, and Old English. And then you, have, you can have access to so much of Dumbarton Oaks thanks to this vision of the donors by coming to the garden, by coming to the museum. And again, I just invite you, please, to come to the home of the humanities. And I thank you for hearing me out now. So thank you. Just one final remark. You really deserve to be uh, relieved of me. But uh, I noticed the predecessor that I think about constantly, which is uh, there were two directors who were family friends, and then after that came a director from Harvard University as the third director. I'm the seventh. And uh, Giles Constable, the third director, is seated there. And uh, he accomplished during his time as director just amazing things that I look back to as orientation points. He, he, what he did is, is, is a kind of lodestar to me, and so it, it moves me greatly to have him here. Thank you. Very illuminating. Um, any quick questions? Yes. Could you explain on the, the name Dumbarton Oaks? Oh, yes. I, I'm, <laughs> sorry. I'm, I'm really sorry. I, so, uh, you know, being my one qualification as a professor is the absent minded part, and I, I definitely had meant to say something about that. Um, Bell, Minnie and Bell saw a similarity in the landscape between this area and then the rock of Dumbarton or Dumbarton, which is on the north side of the Clyde uh, just before Glasgow. And so uh, that was where the, the name came from for the Dumbarton Park. part. The name of the mansion went through several different um, iterations, uh, and it was called Linthicum. It was called by a, a, a really complex Greek name uh, earlier than that. When, when the Blisses came, they ended up adding the oaks to it because there was a, a really uh, wonderful old grove of oak trees there. And so that separates it from Dumbarton House, which is just a few blocks away, which is different, but in that same region of town. And, and uh, Dumbarton, the, the one in what's s still for now, the UK, uh, they, they've approached us wish, wishing to have uh, not exactly uh, sister city or sister institution relations, but they, they want uh, to have exchanges going. It's going to be a steeply sloping terrain. Geologically, is that part of the Rock Creek Ravine which runs through all of Northwest Washington? Yes, you're, you're absolutely correct. Uh, so the uh, Rock Creek Park got a lot of press because of the death of the intern years ago. It's a, a gigantic part of the National Park Service. Um, Dumbart Notes has. Um, the park to the uh, east 
and north of it, Dumbarton Oaks Park, which used to be part of the same property, and then it has Montrose Park to the east. Both of those belong to the National Park Service, and both of them lead uh, to border on Rock Creek Park. The 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 uh, soil is it, it's very steep and it's very unstable, and stormwater management is a, a giant concern to the National Park Service as a, as a result, and, and it is to all of the people who hold land around it to keep uh, keep down erosion. So, so yes. <laughs> okay, last question. This main house is not open. Is it just your museum? So the, the museums are open uh, Tuesday through Sunday, 11.30 to 5.30. There are tours of the main house that are given uh, um, fortnightly uh, that are on the weekends. And so there are docent-led tours of the main house because we can't have tours during the week because, because all the offices are used. Uh, we're, we're, although we've had wonderful campus uh, expansions, um, their space, every square foot is still at a premium. Thank you. Now we'll be available with, and we'll be selling the book outside, and I want to thank you once again. Oh, cool.